All right, so welcome very much, and thank you so much, everyone. And um, everything has been said, I think. Gaston is the artist, the miracle, Peruvian miracle for, for cooking, and uh, Peru has really found its pride, its identity, and its uh, future as well by means of the cooking of Gaston and others. And uh, that's just my opinion, but I think we both share this opinion, and I'm going to go on in uh, uh, Spanish, in, uh, yes, in Sp I still don't know how to say it in Italian. So somehow the face of our country has changed and Gaston has uh, really helped do that, but also the other Peruvian chefs and cooking in general, the way we understand society and life has changed. And there's a phenomenon for me, for example, I started to be a critic in restaurants in Peru um, for 10 years ago and four years ago I moved to Lima and I live in Lima due to a circumstance that I see as very clear because I'm part of a generation that is privileged and that's a generation that has seen all kinds of cooking because my generation has seen the end of classic cooking and uh, that was a kind of cuisine that uh, has been unchanged for 250 years basically and from the French tradition until the end of the 1970s actually nothing has changed and I then experienced the second revolution of cuisine by means of the new Nouvelle Cuisine and um, especially the new Basque kitchen from Spain and some cooking from Spain and that has really changed everything um, in terms of cuisine uh, all over the world. The Mediterranean nature of cooking and the popular culture, which is a very strong inspiration for the culinary tradition. And then finally there was a third revolution, which was a revolution that was uh, due to Fernand and Dia and the techno technology and the science and creativity, um, extreme cre creativity that uh, made cuisine um, an alchemy almost, which uh, really searches for novelty and innovation constantly. So cuisine needs to be something um, to do with experience, something that is repeated, something that is 360 degrees in your experience and, and that's why I don't know exactly, no books were really published with recipes of uh, chefs in the past really. Um, so there were many different types of chefs and now I think that kitchen can be something imagined and a kitchen or cuisine where the chef is working and making an effort to reach new goals and um, what I think also that when Fernando Lalia for example retired and when the economic crisis hit uh, which really also transformed the clientele of restaurants of course and there's a new horizon today there's a phenomenon that um, made Peru a new culinary revolution a revolution that is not to do with technology, that has nothing to do with uh, classes, that has nothing to do with elites, and uh, it doesn't have anything to do even with creativity in the sense that we had before. It's now a revolution that talks about the revindication of roots and biodiversity and a unique and different way of um, cooking. And uh, this is true for Peru, but also Latin America in general, and especially of a social responsibility of cooking, a social concept of cooking so it's a revolution social revolution cuisine as an interactive moment and also the revindication of flags of the Peruvian flag all over the world so um, I decided that I was going to go back to Lima and somehow participate in this revolution and in four years we have seen that that revolution has not just become a Peruvian revolution but it is now a process that is really transforming the way that we conceive cooking all over Latin America. We have Chile now, we have Argentina, Panama, in part Colombia, Mexico, all of them have lifted the flag of their roots and their identities and they're all fighting against foreign cuisine and um, until Gaston started with his proposal really that was the only cuisine that was a point of reference for us in Latin America um, until today was the French kitchen for example the French cuisine which we had taken as the only valid cuisine until until then and uh, and somehow Gaston's now has really defined that whole process and he has marked this new revolution we have done some things together we have written a book together for example and we have collaborated somehow on a daily level with uh, some of the things that I think we are going to propose together. So yes, it is a design, as you said, it is a form of teaching a country um, new, a new culture by means of elements that um, are 
uh, dishes, foods, uh, raw materials, the way of conceiving a product, the way of revindication of a product, and also a way of transforming and recovering the identity and associating all of this not just with the social sphere and a elite practice, but also with everything that surrounds it. So craftsmanship, dishes, design, uh, food design, and decoration even. So textiles, the work of manufacturers, and all the people that a very wide spectrum that lie around this. And somehow I think that this has uh, explained what Gaston has started in uh, Peru and then in Latin America, and it has really become a fascinating period in time for the culinary moment in Latin America. And somehow, not really somehow, but I would say definitely, all of this started with the mind of this gentleman that's sitting next to me. Thank you. Muchas gracias por permitirnos compartir un momento con usted. All right, thank you very much, and um, I thank you for sharing that this moment with us, and thank you for receiving the Peruvian cuisine with so much um, emotion and affection. Uh, this was. Um, this is a moment that we are sharing for the cuisine, Italian gastronomy and cuisine. And when Marchese, for example, we have wanted to share some of our culture with him and our products and our tradition. And we want really seeing now with great emotion that um, what we were taught to believe was not so beautiful for much time. We have now found out that it is becoming exciting. And the same way that we were excited for a long time about products that came from Italy, and this is exactly what it's about. And this project that we have tried to build and participate in, and we are trying to share together those beautiful things that uh, the peoples of the world have. And we are trying to incorporate all that in a right way, in an equal way, in a fair way in the life of people, whether it is in Peru or uh, which are countries of diversity um, of many different climates, many different lands, many different peoples and languages even, many different landscapes and different histories as well. There are histories that started 7,000 years ago, cultures that are all about knowledge, wisdom, and which suddenly, due to different circumstances, were not lost, I would say, but were hidden away. And thanks to the world that we are living in today, which really celebrates diversity because we have all of this information that connects us and it celebrates the fact that we are different as opposed to some years ago where um, it was all about imitating the others and um, not exploring new things. Now we do explore much more every day. And now suddenly we have Peru like a box appearing like a box of treasures, full of treasures that had been hidden away for so long and which today start to share. Uh, with the world. And what we've done in the kitchen, us uh, cooks, is collecting these treasures and uh, the design of Peruvians that were able to design a product and also their environment, starting from their environment, maybe the most popular product of the world, which is called the potato, which was a wild product and which our engineers transformed into something edible, and to the point that they were able to develop thousands of varieties of different potatoes. And just like the potato, there are tens of and hundreds of products that we share with Mexico in some cases, and that today are part of, um, for example, Italy also, the essence of Italian culture, like tomatoes or pepperoncino, for example, the chili pepper, and the new products that today are having so much success in the world. And also collecting the recipes that were not invented by us, of course, uh, but recipes that we were eating uh, with a lot of joy in our homes, but that we did not share with the world because we didn't think that they were important enough, um, while of course they were. And these are recipes that when we add them to the products that we can provide, what we did was we designed a new product with both of these elements that is called Peruvian cooking for the world. And we are trying to express and articulate dishes and products and people and histories 
and styles of this multicultural country, which Peru is, which has a little bit of Chinese, a little bit of Japanese, a little bit of African, some Spanish, a little bit of Italian, and uh, a lot of Andean uh, culture and some southern, uh, northern, western cultures that come together, and transforming all of this into a brand, into a concept that the world did not know about, and uh, because back in or not a too far away past, it could become an international brand, a global brand that represented Peru with its products, with Peru as also a tourist location now, and that could give many Peruvians the chance, uh, many of my co-nationals the chance to have opportunities outside of Peru when they immigrated from Peru in a sad and painful way because they couldn't find opportunities in their own country, and then suddenly had the opportunity of representing their country by means of what they loved most, which was their cooking, in the cities that started to discover this cooking. So inside Peru, on the other hand, there are many chances now for farmers who had been historically forgotten and historically treated badly and tricked by the government in the countryside, in the Andes, in the Amazon, Amazonas, and um, they were looked at with um, ignorance and treated very badly. And forgetting that our days were very happy actually in the past and that we could we were very good at enjoying the simplest things in life things that in life are forgotten sometimes and starting from there we're now building a new scene a new scenario where cooking becomes a very important representative of Peru which finally is recognizing its past and is embracing its multiculturalism and without shame without any inferiority complex, and it's looking at the future with confidence, with optimism and um, security, with also modesty, and with the only illusion of conquering hearts, emotions, and to give people joy, which uh, is our real mission, while we are also bringing joy to our own people with this process. The result has been absolutely unexpected. And in fact, in terms of the speed, it was unexpected of what has been happening because only in the world of our own cuisine five years ago, in fact, there were about uh, 12 restaurants, Peruvian restaurants in a very important city like Miami, for example. Today we have more than 300, actually. And uh, two years ago, there's not a single Peruvian restaurant in London. Today there are about 12 um, very important Peruvian restaurants in, in London and we're still growing and all over the world today in two or three Peruvian restaurants are open in different cities with different concepts going from high cuisine to cevicherias to uh, more sandwich places or grill places typically Peruvian things and that's just thanks to the fact that the world has discovered this form of cooking that they believe in it now and thanks to the fact that there's a united movement of Peruvian cooks and farmers who are working together under the principle of sharing our experiences. And uh, due to this sharing, we are growing together and we're becoming stronger on international scale. And this is what is happening throughout all of this process. The challenges that are coming towards us are very important also. And now we need we need to work very much on something that to you is probably a daily thing, which is design. We need to conceptualize much more, um, a much more powerful way, all of the moments that make up this experience and every one of the concepts that, the Peruvian concepts that exist. And we have to work a lot on every detail for this experience to become even more magical because also the world has discovered that cooking is a very powerful weapon to promote your own country. And all of the world's countries that have their own cuisines have um, found out that they can use their cuisine to promote their country and they're working on recovering their farmers, recovering their cuisine and conceptualizing their concepts and promoting them all over the world. And the chefs all over the world have rediscovered their traditions, their products, their culture and are trying to give more value to their cuisines, to their cooking in a world where everyone is very curious and everyone has a great desire to discover new things every day. So a new way, a new path has opened up for us, but the hour of design, which is the most important hour, has reached us today. And this also implies preparing young people, training them in a much more profound and deep way. 
We are now, for example, making a university in the desert in Lima, and this is a very um, magical, enigmatical place. In fact, it's 30 kilometers outside of Lima. It's a Catholic university. And there, young people are going to come from all over the world to get educated at the university in a universal landscape. It's a humanistic dimension where, first of all, they will learn many things in order to be able to move and excite people by means of their cooking. And they're going to have to learn about philosophy. They're going to have to learn about sociology in order to understand the world that they live in and the anthropology also to know where they're coming from. They know about art, for example, to know about beauty, to know about literature, to know how to t tell stories, physics and chemistry to understand the processes that go on when you cook. Again, ecology also, the environment uh, in order to learn how to respect what you work with and the environment you work in. And then only when you have that knowledge will they be able to be prepared to work with the products and to dialogue with the manufacturers and to dialogue with the recipes to interpret them in their own way and to do magic with what they do and to bring their message to the world. And this is part of the project that we are working on in order to consolidate a process that uh, to us is irreversible, that uh, there's no way back from here and it's going to lead us in the next years to the inevitable thing, which is that our cuisine, the Peruvian cuisine, is going to become an international brand that has just as much importance and presence as, for example, Italian cuisine in the world, with the only difference that uh, this lasted uh, about 250 years it took us to get to this place, and of course it was much faster in the case of a country like Italy. So going from <coughs> behind this, there's a very big production, there's a huge production of many things that just lie around the cuisine and cooking to supply everything that's necessary for this industry, for this expression, this cultural expression, and for these opportunities that go from beer to wine to pisco to salsas to everything or even the, the dishes themselves and the cutlery and the glasses and people and everything that lies behind all of this and also the tr products the products which although certainly in some moment they're not only going to be produced in, in Peru but because, for example, we have uh, Aji Amarillo, which is uh, very, f it's already being produced in California, it's a kind of chili pepper because it's become so famous. But um, also from other points of view, there's going to open up a new uh, market niche with the illusion that in the near future, our farmers and our people, uh, the original people that we have, the Ashanica, the Machigenia, the Aguajuns, which are all in the Amazon region, are going to be the most prosperous of Peru and they're going to be able to walk proudly in their cities with their own design, their own cu culture, because their products will be recognized all over the world. This is one of our challenges that we hope to be able to face in the next years and that will allow us to go back to our original dream which is a small restaurant um, that we had when we had the small first restaurant that we opened. I think that there are two topics I would like to touch upon, starting with one, which is the, the producer, the manufacturer, the farmer, who always is there in the messages, the messages that we're launching out there concerning Peruvian cuisine. And the manufacturer is fundamental, I would say, in all of these processes we're talking about. In fact, I think that about 90% of the farming surface of Peru is uh, due to um, an exploitation of less than a half of a hectare. So when we talk about manufacturers of farmers, in Peru, we're talking about people who are absolutely special and specialized and have a huge responsibility. Our whole cooking depends on them. In fact, the biodiversity of Peruvian cuisine depends on them. And, and there are about 3,000, as you were saying, varieties of potatoes in our country. And if you um, go to uh, Feliciano's house or Victoriano who lives in Montasun and Kiski in uh, one which is in a home that is at 3,000 meters of height in the mountain and uh, that means that you have to travel um, about 800 meters in height just by foot because you can't go there with any other means of transportation. He has 70 um, hectares of mountain farming land for example and there's a lot of forest there as well and that gives um, of course um, 
material for burning, for example, for heating the house and so on, and that's very important. And he understands that not just he, but also his sons and his grandchildren are going to live only due to this land that he has. And also he has some grass for animals that can help him, for example, to pay for the university of his children, who are all doing university degrees, thanks to the meat of the animals that they raise. And uh, they have also, they eat mainly potato, so they eat potato at lunch, dinner, and breakfast. And uh, dedicating 20 of your hectares of farmland to the cultivation of potatoes means that you can only cultivate or grow 1.5 hectares a year, uh, because uh, this kind of cultivation makes the land very poor and needs eight years to recover after one um, harvest. So one harvest you can make every 10 years, basically. One harvest for cereal, then a second one potato, a third needs to be some kind of um, relaxation or break with another kind of, of plant. But the potato needs some resting time. And this man who lives in absolute poverty, who doesn't even have electricity, who um, drinks water from a small crook, that there is a river that is very close to his house, and he cultivates about 500 um, kilos of potatoes um, a year. And that is because somehow this is his responsibility. His responsibility because a farmer, another one is Olinda Takusi, for example, if you know her, uh, she uh, is living in San Antonio Solomoro, and it's right after or right close to the Brai, which is a very big um, drug dealing area, actually. And uh, the, there's a big fight going on in those communities. And the, the only solution has been in many years to escape and um, to go back from not or away from coke cultivation or growing or to going to more traditional things like cocoa, for example, plantations of cocoa. And uh, she had to run away from one hour after she gave birth to her son, she had to run away with her baby and hide away in the forest for a whole day due to the drug dealing problem. And then uh, when uh, she was safe again, she could go back um, to her house. But she still had the umbilical cord of her child attached to her. So these are all stories that are so tragic. And these are the people who are really um, maintaining our country. And uh, there are also other people who are traveling through the country with a truck, for example, with a compressor and a rubber um, uh, snake of uh, 20 meters is long and uh, to just maintain the truck running and so on and he's for example has to fight against sea lions which are these huge animals and um, he has an embolia every three days so this is due to the way that he works these are all the people who make biodiversity possible these are the people who make the Peruvian cuisine possible and have made it come to the point that it has. And they really maintain the 300 hectares of corn plantation, for example, with almost 400 hectares of, um, pepper, of uh, chili pepper right now, or uh, paprika. And also we have <coughs> that paradise of the Andes, for example, uh, which give us so many richnesses. And this is a part that is very important to consider and keep in mind. Another thing is that we talk about design, and the design of a country and design of a culture. And this is a process of creation, of creativity, in, in fact. And the country is taking, getting back its life after 20 years, a very terrible years that it suffered, and we're still in that transformation process. I, in fact, I work uh, sometimes with some of the Awahu communities. And uh, the Awahunas, for example, are a very special tribe. They are very noisy, very high people. They've always lived in the margin. And uh, they were between Ecuador and Peru in that region. And they've always been fishermen and hunters. That's it, uh, not far. Farmers, and they only um, farm yuca to eat. And they have basically now are without fishes. And uh, for example, the rivers are empty. And <coughs> the Amazon River that goes through their region uh, gives them much less fish. And of course, the jungle as well, that has an, in this moment become much more poor. And the Yawahu people are right now going through also a process of design of their culture, of transformation of their culture by means of agriculture. For example, the planting plantations of cocoa and to go out to this uh, farming land across or close to their regions. And the more older the elderly people of the tribe um, are at least uh, not more than 30 or four, maximum 40 years old. In fact, they don't live to be very old. And this community, they live in this Marañón area and the Amazon area, and they all of these country or small towns that 
we know around that region and somehow they have now based their cuisine around cocoa um, around this product which has become their trademark so to speak and in fact this is a topic that I think is absolutely crucial and it's necessary to insist on it to understand exactly what is going on what Akorio was mentioning before so we are in a very rich country we have a terribly rich country not just uh, uh, due to the funds that we receive for the farming and so on but Farming is one of the main, I think, industry of our country. The third is tourism. So all of that depends on exclusively on the fact that the farmers can keep our roots alive and can provide the products. And our cuisine is not possible if we don't have this raw material, these products. So our new cuisine would not be the same if we didn't have, for example, uh, the green, the yellow pepper and the 18 varieties of the limu pepper or the panka or the charapita or or the small wild chili pepper of the forest, or the nochero, or other many, many varieties of chili peppers we have with different flavors, different aromas, different colors that make up our vegetables. Now, this is the only color, in fact, that uh, the, that the yellow pepper cannot have is the real yellow. And in fact, this is uh, the funny thing. We have so many different varieties. And <coughs> Well, Peru, uh, I've gone through almost all of the country and I've been in contact with many of these manufacturers and farmers. And uh, the nice thing about Peru is that even around the corner you can find a life story. Around every corner there's a different story. And um, I don't know, there are types of people that in just one hectare of land can grow 80 varieties of fruit and different um, herbal herbs and aromatic herbs. And they do that because in reality they sell it in the town marketplace. And they do it because it's part of their responsibility that they've learned since they were children and is part of a sense of life that certainly will help us to change Peruvian cuisine in the future. Well, thank you so much, Ignacio, for talking about the farmers because, in fact, um, we today it's the 24th of June which is the day of the farmer in fact in Peru we're more than we have more than 1 million or about 1.5 million families of farmers small farmers in Peru and <coughs> they work uh, from different points of view of life it's different of course from city life and they face uh, different difficulties so it's difficult for us to understand that the concepts of profitability are not just financial in our country but they're also cultural they're social they're nutritional and even economic factors for example are not necessarily mean does not necessarily mean volumes uh, so the return per hectare, but it is also about exclusivity. It's also about other things. So diversity with a form of farming, small farmers, is so important. It is really a very important way of working with the concept of niche markets, trying to find a small market in some place in the world which really gives value to that small production, a unique variety of potato that only grows in one specific place of the Andes at a totally different price and a for a general, general potato that comes from the larger production that doesn't have the same history, that doesn't have a name or surname. So luckily there's never been a better moment than today when uh, we really give value to what is different, we give value to what is unique, to what is original, and the opportunities that our farmers have come from this. In fact, in the way that they connect with the markets of the world, whether it's virtually or by means of marketing or infrastructures, and it has never been so important as today. So we work so much uh, with them in order to try to find these pearls and uh, these rough pearls that are out there, um, not just in, for example, the packaging, but also in the way of communicating their product, the way of telling their story, the way of talking about the virtues, the specific virtues of a specific product um, or another product for one type of cooking or another type of cooking so that we can really um, aim or communicate with a farmer of our land a buyer of uh, this world without having to go through four, five, or ten intermediaries to communicate with these people, and which, of course, um, take away the main profitability of the product. Now, we're also trying to design a future and a virtual 
way of connecting all of the people who produce something so beautiful uh, to someone who consumes something so beautiful. So the people who have a beautiful story to tell with all of the people who want to hear this story. So in this world, this different world, I think we're going to find millions of people that get up every day and want to try something new and want to learn something new, discover something new, and also millions of people who produce these new things. So how can we connect these two types of people? by means of a space, a tool, a vehicle, a page that will allow us to connect, connect all of these communities. So the future, I think, is very optimistic uh, for uh, farmers, but everything goes through one main ingredient, which is that we cannot expect that someone should give value to a product if he does not give value to the person who has produced that product. So if you don't respect that person, then how can you respect the price that, you, that that person thinks his or her product deserves? So before we look for uh, mechanisms or ways or new ways of commerce and trade, fair trade, for example, what we need to do is try to make people respect uh, make people respect these farmers, give value to these people, and uh, say thanks to these people for what they are, for what they do, for what they feel, and starting from that new relationship of respect and friendship and uh, gratitude, the natural consequence of that is going to be this new form of trade where whoever receives something really gives value to what he is receiving because he uh, gives, gives value to the person that stands behind it. This is the moment that we're experiencing. And luckily, in fact, all over the world today, uh, chefs and uh, cooks are really starting to recognize and to accept that they are not the stars of this marvelous chain. But in fact, until very recently, chefs really felt like they were the most important man um, inside the world of cooking and that you, people had to pay respect to them and give them applause for their creations and bow at their feet for their creativity and talent. Uh, but today, chefs start to understand that they're vehicles, that they're just one more piece in this puzzle and that they are a very lucky piece in this story because they work in the middle of the most seducing space of this chain, which is the restaurant. The restaurant where people really take out the best side of themselves. When you sit down at a table, the most beautiful side of people comes up and appears. And in fact, that's the scene. This is the stage that the chefs work in. And that's exactly why they have such a big responsibility in becoming the voice of all the people who deserve at least um, the same benefits that the chef is receiving, but who are very far from that place, who are in the rivers, who are in the mountains, who are in the jungle, producing everything that that chef is going to transform into something something so beautiful and that he's going to seduce people with and that they are going to consume in the cities and in the markets of the world. That's why the chef today, um, as opposed to in the past, where uh, he was a bit more vain and a bit more selfish and didn't want to share his recipes with any, anyone and everything was secret, today chefs are becoming different. They know that if they want to exist, they need to go out of their kitchens and they need to look for the word of the farmer. They need to defend the environmental territories. They need to be at the avant-garde of nutritional topics and you to understand that children are constantly threatened by marketing campaigns of industrial products that these are not necessarily evil or bad but that if they are used excessively they can create uh, consumption habits that are not necessarily well balanced now the chef has a chance I think an opportunity um, due to his power of seduction, he has the power of influencing, positively or negatively, many of the aspects of society today. And it's by means of his cooking, and by means of the things that he presents in his dishes, and the things that he says in the means of communications, in the books, that he can really influence positively the life of people, at least of the people who are part of the activity that he belongs to. Now, 
Just like there are Michelin stars for restaurants, there's also Michelin stars for farmers, I think. And I think that in the future, I hope that this will be the case, that uh, they will be invited to a TV show, and uh, just as they invite a chef, they also invite a small fisherman or a small farmer. And that, I don't know, in the future, one day when you receive a dish in the restaurant, when you see the dish and when you taste it, the consumer in his mind and in his heart will think not only of the chef, but also of the person who has made that dish possible, who has made it possible to exist. And therefore, I think that we chefs have become activists somehow today. And we all do this, each one in our own way. Uh, some of us in a much more personal way. And we practice the principles and carry them out in our restaurants. But the reality, fortunately, is that the chef who today does not respect the land does not respect the products, does not respect the people who produce these products, would not be able to do a beautiful kitchen today, will not have customers, and will not be able to have a restaurant, successful restaurant. So I feel very lucky to have experienced and uh, to have been part of this marvelous moment that cooking is going through today, where finally it is using all of its power that it has always had, really, but that has never been used in the past because it was just confined to the small bubble, uh, sometimes frivolous and playful bubble, uh, to participate in what we're participating in today. And in the case of Peru, due to its contradictions and due to its challenges, and uh, it so soon become, became something more powerful, I think, than other countries, but which today finally is a Latin American discourse. It's a universal discourse today, and gradually it is we're going to see, all of us together, that these things we are fighting for today are finally going to be obtained in the future. Just one small comment and then I think we could go to questions because we've been talking about dreams, we've been talking about future and somehow the future is what gives us the meaning, right? And the meaning of everything that we're doing. And I think therefore somehow that we're talking about future in parallel discourses. When we talk about food design, when we talk about cooking, um, because parallel discourses and sometimes um, discourses that meet also, because um, it's curious that somehow it's a science that um, kind of supports the art of the ephemeral, the art of cooking. And although the dishes are the same always, they're never actually totally the same. And there's always a change, there's always a special touch, and in many circumstances it's uh, not just due to the recipe, but also due to the um, state of mind, the moods of the, of the chef in the different moments. So I think it's very important to make clear that speaking about the future for both of us, if we just hold hands, these two industries, we have to create solutions somehow that uh, support the survival of both of our industries. So cooking is uh, really in need of growth, but it is in a moment of transition and its potential is very far away in reality from the uh, from the finish line, let's say. So we're just taking the first steps today. And we're going to have to start to speed up our process now. And we're going to have to focus on the products, on the farmers. But uh, especially we have to focus on our cooking also. Our cooking is, uh, the majority of our cooking, I would say, is still hidden to um, many people in the world. And we are still confining it to the families, to our homes, right? So it hasn't really left our national borders. And and I think, and especially the diversity of our cooking has not really become famous yet. So I think that cooking right now is Peru, but we are all very excitedly expecting this new um, characteristic of our cooking, which Caston is starting with OPC and with the Catholic University, sorry. And um, it's a university that is going to become global. It is going to be specialized in different sectors, also design. And design, again, is fundamental because 
it really gives society, the Peruvian society, the identity of the products. And it's no use doing this if we don't present them correctly. If we, uh, they're not absolutely well cared for, well presented in a nice packaging, a nice box, and a nice printed on a nice paper. Um, if uh, we have see a fruit or. So even our potatoes, for example, in the festival that we just had in Lima, where they came into these nice one kilo packages with the pa potato photographed on each um, on each packaging and around each potato. So this is all important, and it's one of our big challenges in Peru right now that the Peruvian society should get to know these pr products as well. So learning about these products is important because we are not very many of us yet that know about these products in a deep way, and our society also needs support to make them more visible, to transform this cuisine also inside our national borders. And it's important, I think, this whole process that we're experiencing in Lima with uh, just about eight or ten restaurants, elite restaurants that right now are uh, offering, for example, a design of uh, specific dishes for restaurants and so on. Um, to the message also that we are trying to give to our customers, to try to reflect the identity of their chefs and what to, into what they're doing at that moment. And so cuisine or cooking and design really go hand in hand. They need to be tightly connected. But I think that we need also much more than that. We, we live in uh, the, the avant-garde, we're in the total breaking point. Avant-garde is challenge, it's breaking with the past, it's progress, and we are experiencing this both in cooking but also in design so I would say not just um, also in industrial design applied to cooking for example as I was saying before the cutlery the dishes and so on so rupture also and avant-garde also goes by means of creation of tradition sometimes so we're making cooking also a recovery of old ceramics old dishes that um, the indigenous peoples produced the machingengas for example in the past and uh, I think that right now we're in a moment when cooking englobes everything. It's a cultural manifestation, a first level cultural manifestation, and it really influences all of our production levels and sectors. So I think we're in a very important historical moment. So if you like, if you have any questions maybe for us, we would answer as best we can. So we've been working, yes, to um, bridge that gap. In fact, we're here to bridge that gap, in fact. And uh, in the commercial office of Peru, they have designed a plan for three months, uh, which it doesn't cover the whole six months of the expo, uh, for the different activities that I ha they have been planning. And I've already uh, pronounced this in writing, uh, that we, uh, in these uh, reports we give out every week, I don't think this is the right moment right now to give, uh, keep creating ruptures or tensions. Uh, but yes, the, we have a really pretty negative reality right now, and the work we're doing for now is trying to yes, uh, bridge that gap or cover that hole. And I don't think we'll be able to do that entirely, but we're doing everything we can. Our funds are pretty, our means are very limited, and we don't have a lot of financial availability, for example. I think that the commercial office in Peru is doing a very admirable work to get as much as possible out of the funds that we do have available. And in just the three months, as I was saying, we uh, are going to invite six of the biggest chefs in Peru and Gaston is here now, for example. Then Serafino will be here. Virgilio Martinez is going to come. And then uh, um, also Gaston is the 14th chef in the world, and he is the number fourth. And then we have in Milan, for example, he's the number 44 of uh, the list, the ranking of chefs. So finally, also Tostolis is going to, at the same time, we're going to have meetings also with uh, farmers and coffee growers, for example, fishermen and also designers of fashion, but or cinema, uh, cinema directors. So yes, I will talk about this because um, we have had a very important moment of activities. But I think, yes, we need to also forget about the past and move on for the future. Well, I would just add that uh, I think that it was a very big mistake. 
just like he also thinks that, and he also wrote that, in fact. And I would also say that trying to that all the Peruvian chefs we have tried, we've come here, leaving our families, and also sometimes they've had to cover our costs, to be able to be present in a live way, and uh, coming in a direct way, and reaching the powerful people, and also taking turns to participate day after day, uh, for all of that time, sharing our culture and just the way that we've wanted to, and to make people more curious about about our country, about our culture, and also we've had created this beautiful pavilion coming from the most exuberant uh, diversity country. And But at the same time, we have tried to exploit this opportunity of the people who come to Expo to really come here with our history, with our stories, and try to see if we can balance out the lack, the lacks we have from the past. Just one more question. Hola, yeah. soy Ana Curio e Ignacio Medina. Yo soy una chica italo-peruana y por eso quería agradecerle antes de hacer conocer a todo el mundo la cocina peruana. Y después le quería hacer una pregunta sobre nuestra cocina. About our el utilizo de muchas culturas porque Uh, fui en Perú y vi que um, hay muchas personas diferentes, desde chinos hasta... And there are many, no, there are many different... ...o los americanos, y hay una mezcla de culturas, y por eso quería saber si uh, en la base de nuestra cocina tenemos una mezcla de culturas. Sí. Bueno, la cocina es quizás el territorio más... Eh, eh, allora, se metto la se io metto eh, mi sento me stessa. Quindi... Multicultural. Nel caso di Lima, per esempio, io sono di Lima, è una società multicultural non solamente perché ho ricevuto migrazioni del mondo, sino perché ho ricevuto migrazioni di tutto il Perù. Lo spagnolo? Io se faccio anche sento me stessa. Ok. E non va bene, perché no. non riesco a... Eh. Adesso? Yes, yeah, one, two, three, yes, ok. And the grandmother from Quito and from the jungle, and therefore the other grandmother was from China, and another grandmother from Japan, and another one from Africa. So, the result of all of these cultural backgrounds, which uh, looks almost like something schizophrenic, in fact, is that there is a your own language now. There's our long language. Rochaufa is not a fried Chinese rice, but it's a Peruvian dish because it has a couple of things that makes it different from another Chinese dish. And the more uh, popular and modern expression is the airport because uh, Aeropuerto, it's called, it comes with this um, steak with a little bit of pepper, um, chili pepper on top. And this is Peruvian dish as well, which is born from all of this multicultural background, which I wish could have been the same in all of the aspects that we had in the past. Because while the cooking we have was mixed with all of these different things, the um, migrations and the various people that have reached our country were all um, putting their seed into our culture. And luckily today, the Peruvians can lever on all of this multiculturalism. And we feel lucky to uh, have so many cultures inside our own blood, inside Peru. And that makes us very curious people. And it's a perfect expression that if it is possible to create something new, something beautiful, not just in terms of taste uh, or in terms of the visual aspect, but also in terms of words. Because words that don't exist anywhere else in the world, like cao cao, or anticucho or capu capu, which are words that <laughs> express this <laughs> Peruvian identity, where we have a little bit of each country that has contributed to create something new of this new Peru. So we see <laughs> that we have a new kitchen, and we have a new Nikkei kitchen, for example, which is a mix of Peruvian and Japanese. Then we have Chifa, which is a mix of Peruvian and Chinese. And then we have some French influence as well. Until now, I don't understand why or why or how, but 
uh, we do have all of these influences. And the typical pastel de papas, for example, was a national dick, dish, and it was, invite, it was invented in Arequipa, for example. And it has already been adapted, obviously, and it's been recreated, but it has a specific origin. And this happens with the majority of our dishes, like rice with uh, seafood, which, which is a Peruvian version of a Spanish dish, which has um, chili pepper and is done in a different way. But every dish has this characteristic and variation. And the marvelous thing is that we've been able to articulate all of these multicultural forms of cooking under one umbrella, which is called Peruvian cooking. And when you taste that, you can really understand and notice that it's neither Japanese nor Chinese uh, nor African, but it is Peruvian. Yes, and in fact, there is a version that coincides with this, but also different, uh, which is that somehow the most fascinating thing about Peruvian cooking to me, just beyond what you were saying about the biodiversity and the diversity of the culture, is the famili familiarness of it. So we, it all seems familiar when we taste these dishes, because all of these points of encounter uh, jo join things that we all know, elements that we all know. Uh, for example, our Spanish, uh, what we have brought to, to you, which is also the Arab culture, which is so has enriched our culture so much and um, that is in harmony with the Arab, the Jewish kitchen or cooking that we had in Spain for so many centuries and then we have the white eaten food of, in, uh, of the Jewish foods that was very big also in Spain it's an, and so on and so on and also the Italian influence for example which is so important and has nothing to do with the food that you eat in Italy but it's a very important influence and the French influence on the other hand the French for example is very simple and the high society in Arequipe in Peru uh, wanted to appear something that it was not wanted to seem a bit more elegant and so on and therefore uh, used the French cuisine for that purpose and they were looking towards the French formulas for their dishes for example the presence of cheeses and milk and butter in a country that did not produce any of these products so uh, the Chinese the Japanese uh, food the same thing if you go to Morocco anywhere in a popular restaurant you can eat for example uh, couscous in Ar Argelia or in to and also Morocco, as I was saying. So cooking travels and food travels. And what Peruvian kitchen has is that it has joined all of these things together. And now it is not reflected yet in society. In fact, it is funny or curious that the kitchen that we have in Peru really reflects the highest level of elegance that I know on a global scale. And this kind of uh, culinary elitism that uh, transforms everything and makes everything new, which has become the everyday exercise that we practice. And it's becoming familiar. It's something familiar, something that is very close to everyone, every people of the world. Okay, so my question, Mr. Akuri, would be this. Why do you, who are here in Milan, why did you not make a Peruvian dinner in a Peruvian restaurant for Peruvian guests, for example, um, so cooking for them where they could um, see you cook in a Peruvian restaurant with Peruvian guests? Why not? Because our industrialists, Peruvian restaurant um, industrialists, are um, developing the Peruvian culture. And uh, what I mean is that the Peruvians who have come here, who have slept in the back of the kitchens and all that, are now becoming restaurant owners. Well, yes, first of all, because no one proposed it to me until now. And therefore, well, I'm proposing it. Well, what I try to do within my possibilities is, of course, doing everything I can for my, that I can for my country without any obligation to do so, of course. Uh, but let's say I always try to do anything I can. And if something is proposed to me, I put it in my agenda. And uh, I sit down, for example, just like we've done now, and I talk about it. So uh, the dinner that we did yesterday, for example, for Italian professionals, we can do the same thing for Peruvians. And I have taken pictures with many chefs, even in Monza, where we went at the dinner yesterday. 
and however, the truth is that no one proposed it to me, and if no one proposes it, then um, I don't usually do it. No. Well, I'm proposing it for your next visit, if you don't have time this time. Well, I would love to. And we could do a dinner like this, and um, we would, of course, uh, take care of all the expenses for all of the guests. No, that's not necessary. Absolutely not. I would take care of that, so uh, you would not have to pay a single penny. But what is important, however, is that, well, for example, I received an email some time ago from a city, from a group of people, a small group of people in Peru, um, and it's a city in Peru, and they were all cooks in Peru from this city. And they were asking me why I had not made a mixtura in their city, why I did not make an event from in their city. I'm from Lima. So I answered them uh, saying, well, I think that would be a, um, you know, disrespectful from my behalf if I came from Lima to show you um, and to make an event for you or a fair that you should be doing, that you should be organizing. You need to give value to your own products and I would be very happy to come and celebrate with you and to celebrate what you have obtained, but not to do it myself. And I asked them, so your group, you could do these things. And they said, no, we can't do that because this restaurant is no good and they, this guy cooks really bad. No, that guy is worthless and the only guy who's really good is me and so on. So I explained to them that the real point of departure that allowed us in Lima to do some things like misturas or start to travel together and without competing but just sharing our experiences was the moment when we got rid of all of this mistrust and all of this belief that we are b competing against each other and started to work together as a team to help each other and uh, not talking badly about the next guy. So I'm just saying this because it also happened to me yesterday that someone said, no, this, is, this guy is really bad, he doesn't know his job and so on. So, okay, I'm really happy to come and celebrate the union of Peruvian chefs in Italy. Yes. I am a farmer of the northern part of Lima, from Carapango, the province. <laughs> Thank you very much. For me, it is a dream to have the man here in front of me who started the alliance with us, the small farmers of all the regions of Lima and the big chefs of Lima. Today, we do all the trade fairs together in Brazil, for example, with a product that's called Waimando which I really thank Mr. Gaston for all of these innovations that he's doing of our Inca product. And I'm also looking for markets here, like for markets for the Waimanto product. And I really hope that God will bless you and that you can go on with your project and that Peru will be big as in the times of the Incas and uh, like the fruit of the Inca, the Waimanto, that it may be prosperous as you. I have brought some for you here. All right, so we have to conclude here. 
Thank you so much for uh, this important lesson. And uh, you, Arcurio, but also Ignacio Medina. And I really think that the most important thing that you have to have is the vision. You have the strategic vision. You have the systemic vision. This is the most important thing that you have taught us today for your activity, but not just for your activity, for the country in general. Because you know that the, the, this is a positioning. You know what you have to do to spread the culinary culture. But in this case, culinary culture is value. It's a competitive advantage. So we have a more ancient uh, cooking, more than 250 years, you know that. But I think that we have in Italy, uh, we have to put innovation together with tradition. And this is what you have understood. So that um, you know what tradition is, but you know that tradition needs to be transformed in a contemporary way. And this is the contribution of design. This is what design can do. And design, in fact, is packaging, but it is also a place um, where you can experience an emotion in your restaurant. It is an experience because you have a story, you have a history and you talk about the history of this product. It's a system, it's a design system. And you have this vision. And I think that to us, this is the most important thing. Your lesson today uh, has taught us exactly this, because I have a school with 50 different countries um, present in the students. And to me, the value of Milan is this opening towards new things. And you are something new that can really give a value. And I also think that we, with Italian cooking, have to learn from this approach you have to uh, cooking, but not just to cooking. It's uh, cooking as an, a strategic element to um, lever on an economy. So thank you so much. And thank you also to Ignacio Medina for your words. And I am so sorry for my Spanish, I have not studied uh, design, I studied economy, economics, but I'm in love with design and with cooking. So thank you so much for my, also thanks to the food design students, thank you to the teachers, uh, Vittorio Castellani, who is a friend of Latin America, Franco Antonazzi, and also Promo Peru, who organized this event with us today, and also to uh, Tamara from the official commercial office of Peru. Thank you all.